I call uh, His Excellency Dr. Nasser Saidi for the second presentation. I think that we're going to speak about PPPs maybe also among Good afternoon, marhaba, and thank you for inviting me to be with you. So let me, for the sake of good governance, announce right from now, I don't have any interest in any oil companies, either here or outside. I'm not planning any interests with them. I'm not advising any of them. I work a lot on corporate governance, and as you'll see from the title, um, what I really care about is can the Lebanese benefit from the energy windfall which is being, prom which is being promised to us? And um, the short answer is going to be that we, are not only, we will only benefit if we have the appropriate governance structure in place. It is governance which gives you the results, not anything else. So what do we know so far? And these numbers can change. The first thing we know is that there should be about 25 trillion dollars, 25 trillion cubic feet, and maybe some 15 trillion cubic feet is recoverable. So not necessarily everything that is announced or estimated is actually going to be recoverable. The IMF and others estimate that the revenues could represent once you have production in place and you start collecting, that could represent 4 to 5% of GDP. And that would represent about 14 to 15% of government revenue once you are in full production and you are collecting the revenue. But of course, this is uncertain because we live in at a time at which oil and energy prices are highly uncertain. They're very volatile. So we cannot be certain until we start extracting. So as a result, I need to give a warning. There should not be too much hype. We have to avoid unrealistic expectations and irrational exuberance. So on the current numbers, this is not going to be a game changer. If we're talking about 4 to 5% of GDP, this is not a game changer for us. And if government deficits continue at current rates, 4 to 5 percent of GDP is not going to change the macroeconomic situation in Lebanon. So there's a warning there. Now, what sort of framework do we need? We need three items, and I would recommend that a paper that was issued by the IMF in the last quarter of 2014 be distributed and also translated into Arabic. We need three things. We need a fiscal regime, so we need to understand exactly what are the royalties, what is the taxation, what is the share of government in potential gas revenues. That's one element. Second, we need to have a clear macro fiscal anchor, uh, by which I mean that we need to understand that the oil and gas, potential oil and gas, is not for us. It is all for us and for future generations. So what we need to make sure is that there is intergenerational equity and that we need to have the institutions in place that will ensure that intergenerational equity. And a sovereign wealth fund will play a role in that. The third and critical point is that underlying the other two, the fiscal rules and the macro fiscal regimes, is you need an institutional framework. We've just heard from Sadaboul about what we have in place, but I'm going to be making some suggestions as to how we can put in more safeguards. We're still missing, as was just explained, a various decrees. We don't have a petroleum tax law yet in place. We have to have the exploration and production agreement. And from my point of view, we need engagement of the private sector, and that means public-private partnership. We have a draft law and resolution that has been available for the past six years or seven years. It has not passed through Parliament. It has not passed even through the Cabinet. But until you have in place a framework for participation by the private sector, then we 
cannot move forward. So we'll need PPP as part of the overall framework. Now, there are four questions you need to ask yourself, and this is at a general level. The first is, how much should we deplete? Assuming we find gas and oil, how much should we deplete? How much should we keep in the ground, and how much should you extract? The answer from a strictly economic point of view is that you should ex deplete enough or extract enough so that it makes no difference whether you keep it in the ground or you take it out and you sell it. So you arbitrage. So the present value of resources left in the earth, in the ground, or under the sea, should be the same value as what you would sell on the market. So that's one rule. It does not mean that you want to deplete everything. Second is you need to ask yourself, how much are you going to save? Uh, people think that oil and gas revenues are revenues. They are not revenues. They are national wealth which we extract from the ground. The best rule is to save most of it and to consume and count as income a fraction of the financial wealth that is transformed. Okay. So this is not revenue, and therefore it should be accounted for separately from other sources of revenue. And this is critical for treating future generations with some degree of equality. The third question we'll need to ask is, once we have revenue, what do we do with that revenue? How much to invest domestically and how much to invest internationally? If you look, for example, at the GCC countries, much of what they have extracted is invested internationally through investment funds, sovereign wealth funds, and the rest. Why? Because they're highly dependent on oil and gas as a major source of revenue they need to diversify sources of revenue so they invest internationally to diversify against their risks because they're highly dependent on oil and gas. We might not have that problem. What we might want to think of, and this is part of the national dialogue and discussion that needs to take place, is how much will we invest domestically? How much should go into infrastructure in particular? How much should go into education? These are parts of the discussion. Second, when we ask ourselves how much to invest internationally, we'll have to look at what is the cost of the existing public debt. Our existing public debt in Lebanon, number one, is substantial. We're running at public debt close to 140% of GDP, and it is expensive. We have borrowed at very high rates. So we need to ask ourselves, should I invest internationally, or should I take some of what I have extracted to lower the public debt. So that is part of discussion that needs to take place. Now, this is a picture I want you to look at with attention, and then I'll show you the numbers behind it. This shows in green those countries that have reasonably good governance of their natural resources. There are 58 countries on the map, and you'll see those that are in red or in orange or yellow, fail the governance test. So 80%, uh, 11, only 11 of 58 countries, less than 20%, have satisfactory standards of transparency, disclosure, and accountability. Only 11. And as you can see, none of them are in our region. If anything distinguishes our region, it is the lack of transparency and good governance. Now, these are the criteria that stand behind that map. And I want you to look at it because what I'm going to suggest, we don't have time to go through all of these. But they go through the different aspects of managing a natural resource, from extracting it, to reporting, to what sort of safeguards, to having an enabling environment, a legal, regulatory, fiscal environment, to reporting practices once you have extracted the oil and what you're going to be doing with it, to what sort of uh, quality controls should you have on government, on sovereign wealth funds, on various aspects. Now, what I would like to propose, since we're in the ESA and Mr. Fuad Mahzoumi has a national dialogue going on, and we've all talked about 
involving civil society, which is critical. Because remember, at the end of the day, this is not the government's wealth. This is not Parliament's wealth. This is our national wealth. It is for everybody. And not only the people who are here now, but it's also future generations. And they are not represented now. It is our children and our children's children. So we need to make sure that things are in place. So what I would suggest is that everybody who is here, who has been responsible for bringing us together, should adopt these criteria and judge everything that is happening from the LPA to the ministry to the Council of Ministers to Parliament according to those criteria of good governance. They are quantitative criteria. They are available online. There's something called the Natural Resource, Resource Governance Institute. I invite you to visit it. Um, and here's a map of our countries in the world. So it's the Resource Governance Institute. So this, these are the countries that I showed you on the map. Okay. The highest ranked in terms of governance, quite well known as an example, is Norway. Then you've got the US, May, Brazil is, is there, Canada, and a couple of others. So they rank fairly highly on, in terms of governance. Come to our part of the world over here, Myanmar is down here. Libya is there, Iran, Qatar, etc., Saudi, all of them don't rank very highly in terms of governance. In fact, they rank very badly in terms of governance. So what we need to look at, our standards, should be those countries with high levels of governance. That's what we should be doing. And we need to do it now. In other words, we need to say, I want to abide by the highest standards. And you do it now, not when you've done the drilling, not when you've issued the licenses, you do it in advance to make sure that the license process, the awards of the licenses, everything has the appropriate transparency and disclosure. Now, what sort of evidence do we have? The evidence is very clear, and I think uh, Dr. Fadi Mayer was pointing to some of it. What happens when things go wrong? Um, we know when you have a natural resource bonanza, when you get the oil and gas, you tend to have an appreciation of your real exchange rate. Capital comes in, exchange rate appreciates, there's in local inflation, wages go up, and you have what's called Dutch disease or Arab disease. You are no longer internationally competitive. Okay? So what we know is that it becomes more severe and the outcomes are worse, with countries which have bad institutions and lack the rule of law. Second, we know that natural resources encourage conflict and encourage rent grabbing, corruption, and bribery. Very clear in terms of the evidence. Number three, resource rich developing countries, such as potentially us, find a great deal of difficulty converting the exhaustible resources into other productive assets. Look at a country like Nigeria, you can multiply the examples. Although they've got the natural resource wealth, they have not transformed that wealth into productive wealth. They have not had productive citizens. They are not technologically advanced. Because of their reliance on the natural resource, they did not go into research and development, into science and technology. We need to avoid that. And finally, um, oil prices, gas prices, energy prices are highly volatile. These are commodities. So you need to make sure that you spend wisely and you invest wisely. Oops. We seem to have a problem. I'm sure. Well, here we go. Okay. I want to come to, I'm going to be suggesting a number of initiatives that, that we need to get into. Uh, let me just go back once. Okay. First initiative, and this was mentioned by Mr. Daboul, is that we need to act together. That is civil society, all of us, universities, anybody who can, NGOs and all the rest, to make sure 
that we join the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. This makes sure that whatever monies and revenues are being paid by the companies, we know about them. There is disclosure. Governments disclose what they get and it's disclosed to everybody, not to only one particular party in, in the process. So we should put that on the agenda and we should ask for it. It should not just be the LPA which is asking for it. All of us should be asking for it. This is available in Arabic. So I would ask our media to publish it and talk about it. There is something else called the Natural Resource Charter. And you'll find this on the Resource Governance Institute. It's an organization which is an NGO. I'm going to give you what that charter says. Again, we don't have a lot of time. And I'll give you what the precepts are. But this charter is very important because it gives you a framework for the overall governance of our natural resources. It's a set of principles to guide us and governments and society for the use of natural resources. So let me mention quickly what those are. These 12 precepts guide you all the way from um, the initial foundations, that is, what strategy you should have for extracting resources and who should go about it and how you should govern that, to how do you report and what do you do with the revenues from the resources. These are the precepts. Um, so the first is that uh, it should be part of a national strategy, that it should have a clear legal framework and competent institutions, point number one. So we should start ranking all our laws and regulations and institutions according to that precept. Precept number two um, requires decision makers, government, the LPA, the ministry, to be accountable to an informed public. Accountable to an informed public. Notice it is not accountable to parliament. It is accountable to an informed public, to all of us, because again, this is our natural resource wealth. Number three, you have to have efficient exploration and production and allocation of rights. Number four, the tax regime and contractual terms should encourage investment and production, but also to realize the full value of the resource. You don't want, for example, to encourage a lot of extraction at one go. You want to extract over a period of time because prices are changing and conditions are changing. So your tax regime, your royalties, your sharing, all of that has to make sure it happens to realize the highest value of those natural resources. You need to look at the environmental and social costs. So far, if I look at the discussion in public, we haven't even discussed what's going to happen to the environment and the social costs. We need to start talking about that. So it is about governance, it, was, it is about environment, it is about society and the social costs from that. Precept eight and precept nine are important because what they talk about is making sure that whatever revenue that we get from those natural resources are well spent and that uh, they're spent in a smooth fashion. So for example, let's take a rule if we've got the revenues, we might cut them into a sovereign wealth fund. We could have two motives for a sovereign wealth fund. One is to save for future generations and earn part of that income. Another one is to say, because oil and gas prices are fluctuating, we need to have a buffer. So when oil prices are high, we keep a good fraction in the fund. When the oil prices go down, we extract money from the fund for our operations. So that's what it means to have smooth domestic spending of revenues. Um, so those are the 12 precepts. If we have time later on, we, we can discuss them. But what I'd like to submit really is that we ask our government, our parliament, all of us work to establish that charter and abide by that charter. So what sort of recommendations? 
And that's my last slide. Um, we need to have safeguards to ensure against corruption. Unfortunately, our country, as you well know, is a country which is not reputed for transparency and disclosure. If anything, nowadays it is reputed for corruption and bribery. We need to make sure that that national wealth does not disappear. We need a fiscal responsibility law, which we don't have. So it's not sufficient to just say how we're going to tax. We need a fiscal responsibility law. So everybody's held accountable. And in the absence of a Freedom of Information Act, at the moment, Lebanon does not have a Freedom of Information Act. So if I want to find out something and ask a ministry or an agency, I don't have particularly any rights to do so. So if you want to ensure transparency and disclosure and accountability, we need to pass a Freedom of Information Act. I developed a draft back in the year 2000 with a team of NGOs, lawyers, etc. It's still waiting in the drawers somewhere. But that is something we should request. We need an independent regulator. In other words, whenever you're dealing with a commodity, with a natural resource, you have to separate policy making from regulation and from production. These are three separate decisions. LPA should be an independent regulator. It should not be under the ministry. It should be on its own so we can hold it accountable. But we need a national oil company as well if we're going to be undertaking production. So once we get to that decision about production, set up a national oil company. Ministry, cabinet, etc., is for policy making, not for getting involved in production or anything else. Licensing and all the rest is done by a regulator because you don't want your minister involved in giving licenses for all the good reasons. We should set up a sovereign wealth fund. We should abide by the EITI, Extraction and Transparency. And there's something called Publish What You Pay. In other words, we should insist that all the companies, all the operators, tell us what they pay and to whom they have paid it. Otherwise, we will not have the transparency and disclosure that we need. And as I said, let's adopt the Natural Resource Charter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Saidi, for this outstanding PowerPoint presentation as usual. It's a lesson learned presentation. And I think that with the suggestion that you have presented and the work that LPA are implementing, we could be the country number 12 between the 58 countries that are doing good governance. Thank you. Inshallah.